Well, welcome to our wonderful Words of Life radio broadcast today. God bless you. Praise God. Glad you're here with us. Listen, the psalmist says this, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. And then John recorded in Revelation chapter 22, you are, speaking of Jesus, you are the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And then the psalmist again says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Well, let's just take a moment. Let's just worship God. Father, we love you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. We thank you, Father, for your patience and your mercy. Lord, your long suffering, hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for granting us life and health. And Lord, prosperity, praise God, you have prospered us. And we thank you for it, Father, and we give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, you are holy. You are the great God. Lord, there's none beside you in all the earth. So, Father, we thank you so much and we glorify your name. Hallelujah. Lord, your name is excellent in all the earth, Father God, and you've set your glory above the heavens. Praise God. Amen. And we thank you for our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You are the God of Israel. And you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it is you who does wondrous things. And so, Lord, we bless your name and we glorify uh, your name forever. And, Father, we know that the whole earth will be filled with your glory, Father, and we thank you for that. Now, Lord, uh, we pray for those who are brokenhearted today. Maybe they've lost a loved one. Maybe, Father, that the Uh, Their world has just been turned upside down in just a moment of time. And Father, there there may be discouragement uh, in their heart that they're dealing with. Uh, uh, Father, they've just lost their way. Lord, we lift them up in the name of Jesus. And Father, we ask you, Lord, that as they humble themselves, Father God, and, and that they're asking you, Lord, they're looking to you for a supernatural turnaround. Lord, we're asking you right now, uh, Father, that uh, turn their life around. Father, maybe some that are sick and not feeling well. Maybe they're dealing with uh, symptoms and, and maybe they're dealing with diseases today. Father, we're asking you, cause their health to spring forth speedily. Lord, let the health of their countenance, Father, recover. And Lord, we just spread over them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Your word. And Father, we thank you that you are our healer. Lord, you are the one that heals our breaches. You are the one that restores us to health. And we thank you for that, Father and Lord. And we just give you all the praise and honor and glory. Now, Father, on behalf of this Bible study, we ask you now, Lord, to open up our eyes. Lord, give us truth today. Holy Spirit, work in our eyes and our ears and our heart. Help us to receive Father, the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wait, we are in the uh, Paul's first letter uh, to the Corinthian church. We'll be in chapter 5 today. And uh, this is a, a challenging chapter because uh, Paul is having to deal with Uh, with an issue that um, the leadership in the church of Corinth were not willing to deal with. And so it is a very uh, direct uh, challenge. It's a uh, a strong exhortation. Uh, It is a rebuke that Paul has uh, for the leadership of the Corinthian church. And so we've uh, we've entitled, or I've entitled, uh, the, the title of this uh, study today is The Church's Need uh, for Holiness. The Church's Need for Holiness. And so we're going to go ahead and read uh, just 13 verses in this chapter, and then we'll stop along the way and we'll make some comments here and there. But notice that Paul begins in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and he says, It is re- Reported commonly, notice that, 
It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that, that's the, those that are outside of the church now, among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, when Paul said it is reported commonly or universally that uh, this subject that, uh, that the Apostle Paul now is going to begin to broach is uh, something that uh, is not just hearsay. I mean, this is a situation in the church that has uh, reached Paul and has come in the mouth of two or three witnesses that we know that the household of Chloe brought forth uh, some news to the Apostle Paul of things that were going on in the church. And, of course, you know, Paul being an apostle and a learned apostle, a learned disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has investigated this and he has found this, uh, the, the things that he is writing this church about to be true. And so we've already covered in the first four chapters about the envying and the strife and the divisions uh, that existed in the church. And now uh, Paul is beginning to uh, rebuke the church concerning open sin. This is open sin. This is sin that the leadership of the church knew about. But yet they're not doing anything about it. They're not addressing this issue. And so this is, this is uh, something that... Uh, it's like a cancer that is in a person's body. If that cancer is not caught early, and if it's not cut out, it's going to affect the entire body, and eventually that person is going to die. And so this is a very serious matter. And uh, we see a lot of that today. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of the, the world, the, a lot of the lust and, and sexual immorality that's in the world has gotten into the church and people just aren't judging this. And it's something that needs to be judged. It needs to be put out of the church. And of course, we'll, we'll find out going through this chapter what Paul is advocating here. But now notice that uh, Paul says that this, this sin, the fornication, this sexual immorality uh, that exists in the church is not even mentioned among the Gentiles. Now, can you imagine what kind of a witness that is to the Corinthians that are not born again believers, that are not Christians. They're seeing things, immorality worse than what they see in their city going on inside of the church. Now, what kind of a witness do you think that is? How many of the Corinthians do you think are going to be able to go out and witness and win others to Christ? Well, I don't know of too many. Maybe they're having some effect, but not to the degree that the Lord would have them uh, have an effect upon uh, the city of Corinth. And then Paul goes on and says this, and ye are puffed up. Actually, what Paul is saying, and ye are proud, and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. Now, we're, we're beginning to see now what Paul wants what Paul's judgment is concerning this man that uh, is in open sin. Now, notice again, Paul said, you are puffed up. NIV says, and you are proud. See, the, the root problem in Corinth, all the way up, including this chapter, is the sin of pride. Pride is at the root of every evil. When you think of all the mortal sins, the sins unto death, you can draw every one of those down to the very fact that it is the sin of pride that is the result of all other sins. The writer of Proverbs says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So pride is the chief of the sins and it is the root of all other transgressions. Amen. Now, there is an aspect of pride that is not sinful. For instance, you know, I'm proud of the 29 years that my wife and I were pastors. I, I, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that we were able to help people and get people saved and get people healed and get people filled with the Spirit and, and help uh, young believers along in their faith. We're, we're very proud of that. That makes us very happy. 
there's there's a, a gratifying effect in my heart to know that uh, that God uh, took uh, my wife and I and were a, and, and and took us and brought us into the ministry and 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 put us in a place to where we could be a tremendous blessing. And we think in that aspect of the ministry that that has brought a lot of glory to God. Now, I'm proud of that fact. I'm very happy that there is, there is a pride that brings satisfaction to our heart, especially when we know that we've helped others and we've, we've done the will of God. There's a, a pride in that. There's a happiness in that. There's a gratification in that. But that's not the kind of pride we're talking about here. Uh, the, the sin of pride is when we, uh, Think only of ourselves. Uh, this type of, of sinful pride is a self-centeredness. You know, people who make a lot of money, that money becomes their God. And, and they, they sit over that money and, and, and they use their money uh, to, uh, to manipulate and, and cause uh, people and force people to do what they want them to do. That, that, that there's a, a pride in sports where you can you can see the pride uh, when uh, when different football players they score touchdowns or they hit a home run. You can see that pride on their face. You know when they when they hit a ball that they know is going out of the park and let, they look back. Uh, to other people and, and, and they, they consider themselves, you know, nobody could do that like I can do it. That's, that's the kind of pride that is, pride that is devilish. You know, that, that's the pride that moved Eve, uh, to disobey the Lord's command and eat the forbidden fruit. It was pride that moved Lucifer to rebel against God Almighty. And this kind of pride seeks to glorify self at the expense of others. We see that today with the billionaires that have entered into the political world and, and they're trying to move uh, whole nations uh, to, to do what they want them to do, to manipulate, force nations to do uh, what, uh, what they want to do. And this is the kind of, of devilish pride that, uh, that the Bible says it's gonna, it goes before uh, destruction. In other words, God's going to destroy it. He's going to destroy pride. And is going to destroy those who are proudful. And then uh, the writer of Proverbs says this, Better it is of a humble spirit to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And so we see here that there is a humility that is of God. It's one of the fruit of the spirit. Pride is a work of the flesh. And so the Corinthian leadership, they were guilty of pride. And the reason they were guilty of pride is because they would not judge and discipline the church member who was committing known sexual immorality. And by they refusing to deal with this type of blatant sin, they were actually condoning that behavior. Now think about that. Now what is the main purpose of the church? It is to glorify God to bring glory to God and to bring glory in such a way that the, that the people on the outside are impressed. They, the, the whole purpose of, one of the main purposes of God raising up Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles, to the nations around them. They would look at Israel and they say, there's no God like, like the God of Israel. Amen. Now we are a reflection of Jesus. We are the church is to be a reflection of Jesus. And when the world looks at the church and they see the church is worse immorally than, than they see in the world, they're going to laugh and mark the church. This is one thing that we need to understand. The world expects the church to be different. They may laugh at the church, mock the church. They may not agree with the church's stand, but they do expect the church to be different. Amen, praise God. And so we are to be different. We are to be separate, amen, from the things that are in the world. And then Paul goes on and he says this, for, for I verily, well, let's read verse two again. And ye are puffed up and proud and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. Remember, we were talking about cancer in the body, how it needs to be cut out. Verse 3 says, For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done that hath so done a deed. So evidently, 
You know, if we reflect upon what Jesus said about discipline in the church in Matthew chapter 15, somebody evidently had already gone to this man to talk to him about this sinfulness, this open sin, this uh, incestuous relationship that he had with uh, his father's uh, wife, and he didn't repent. So evidently they took two more, and he absolutely refused to repent. And then the leadership then just did nothing about it. You see, and this is where the church is wrong. You know, when we have deacons that are shacking up with their girlfriends and and it's known in the church and yet nobody does anything about it. The leadership doesn't do anything about it. That is a black spot upon that church. And I'm telling you, God is going to have something to say with the pastor and the leaders of these churches. If they're not willing to judge sin, well, we don't want that person to, you know, to leave the church. Listen, who do you, who would you rather have leave the church? That person that's in sin and will not repent or the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Would you rather the Holy Spirit lift his presence up from the congregation because they're not judging sin and putting it away? Oh, I I, I tell you what, I would rather lose a few church members and know that I've pleased God and uh, and the Holy Spirit to move in our midst and and then vice versa. Now, notice what the Apostle Paul says, for I verily is absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done so, that hath so done a deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul's terminology here. When ye are gathered together, what Paul is saying is, you better call assembly. You better get the heads and the leaders, churches together, call an assembly of the church. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the spirit, for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is stiff discipline, but that's exactly the kind of discipline that Jesus said the church needs to have. Now, once again, Corinth was a licentious city. There was all kinds of sexual immorality going on. And because the church was filled with a bunch of babies, spiritual babies, a bunch of carnal people uh, that weren't, uh, didn't have their spiritual antennas up, that sin now that was outside of the church now has gotten inside the church, and it's even worse than it is outside of the church. And, and the church leaders are standing around, and they're not doing anything about it. Well, we talked to the brother, but he's not willing to repent, so... You know, we'll just uh, we'll just ignore it. You can't ignore you can't ignore cancer. Listen, I remember a church member years ago was diagnosed with cancer, and someone in the church came up to them and started talking to them about it. You know what this person said? Oh, it's nothing. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to worry about it. It's nothing. Well, let me tell you, it is something. When the doctor says you have cancer, that cancer is a something. <laughs> it's not a nothing. Well, what happened to this Christian? What happened to this person that was diagnosed with cancer? Well, this person died. This person would not address the issue, just ignored it. And that cancer took over that person's body, and that person died. Thank God she went to heaven, but she could have lived a lot longer on this earth and fulfilled the ministry that God had called her to. Amen. You can't ignore these things. You can't just stick your head in the ground and say, oh, you know, no, I'm just not going to pay attention to that. Listen, if there's sin in our life, God knows it. The Lord Jesus knows it. Amen. And and Paul said this to the Corinthian church, and we'll get over in this when we get over into chapter 11. Uh, Paul said this, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord so that we will not be condemned with the world. And then Paul said that this is the reason why these things that I'm addressing is the reason why many of you are weak, many of you are sickly, and many of you have died prematurely. Amen. God expects us to judge sin and put it away. 
on an individual level, but also on a corporate level too. Amen. Now, listen to what else Paul says here. Beginning in verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here's the Corinthian church. They're ignoring this man that's in open sin, that's putting a black spot upon the church and upon the leadership and everyone within it. Remember the sin of Achan? Remember the sin of Achan? It affected the entire nation of Israel. Unrepentant sin, blatant open sin, does not only affect that individual, it affects the whole entire congregation. It does. And if the leadership doesn't judge that sin, then God is going to hold the entire church responsible. Oh, man, I'm telling you right now, that's enough to make your, your feet begin to tingle, amen, and your body begin to shake. Listen, brothers and sisters, I don't want to stand before God with unrepentant sin in my life and have to explain to the Lord Jesus Christ on that day why I knew there was sin in my life, but I refused to judge it. I don't want, I don't want, to, I don't want that. I don't want to stand before the Lord Jesus and have to do that. Listen, if there's sin in my life, I want to get it out now. I want to repent of it and get it out now. <laughs> Praise God. Not on that day. Amen. Praise God. And so here's the Corinthian church. They're glorying. Oh, you know, we've got this program going on and we're reaching this group and we're feeding this group and we're doing all these wonderful works. Yeah, well, we got this guy over here that's in sin and he won't repent. But, uh, you know, there's so much good that we're doing and so we're just going to ignore that. No. No, Paul says this. He says, your glorying is not good. You're full of pride. Pride is at the root of this issue. That's the reason why you refuse to judge it. And the pride of that individual that refuses to repent, you're not doing anything about it, so now you're guilty as an accessory. See how cancer spreads? See how the cancer of sin spreads? It started with that one individual, and now it's spread all over that congregation. And the only cure is going to be to deal with this, with this sin that's uh, existing in this church. Now listen to what else Paul wrote. He said in verse 9, And I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, those that are sexually immoral, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners, uh, that would be robbers, or with idolaters, for then must your knees go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother that claims to be a Christian, but yet he's practicing fornicating, sexual immorality. He's practicing it. This man was practicing sexual immorality or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, that's a reviler, somebody that, you, that uh, just gets wrathful and just causes trouble, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, a swindler. Do we have swindlers in the church? Oh yeah, we've got swindlers in the church. With such an one, no, not to eat. You don't, we don't have anything to do with them. If, the, if these people, if they refuse to repent, cut them off. Cut them off. Verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not ye judge them that are within? But with them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You see, and, and, it's, and it's sad for me to have to confess this, but in my, in early in my pastoral career, there were some people in the church that were working behind my back and it was told to me, and you know what I did? I did absolutely nothing about it. And I just thought in my mind, well, we'll just let this thing go, and it'll just straighten out. No, it's not going to straighten out. Things are just going to wax worse and worse, and they did. 
And what happened is that there, were, there wound up being a big, big blow up in the church and I wound up losing a bunch of folk over it because of division, see, a cancer. It was a spiritual cancer. I knew about it. I, it, was, it was told to me. I knew of it, but yet I refused to do anything about it. And as a result, that cancer spread throughout the congregation and I wound up losing a whole bunch of folks over it. You see, this is why these things need to be addressed. Envy, strife, and division, these things need to be addressed. Now, much of what we, uh, in counseling, we can do it from behind the pulpit and and, and teach people and show people that they're to love one another. But there's some things you're going to have to, we are going to have, as Christians and as church members, we are going to have to address And a lot of people think Chloe, well, she was just a gossiper. No, she was not a gossiper. The house of Chloe was not a gossiper. These were real issues that the Apostle Paul needed to know about. And when he investigated, he found out, yep, this is exactly what's going on in the church. Amen. And so these are the things that need to be addressed in the church. This is why I've entitled this message, The Church's Need for Holiness. Now listen to what some of the, some scriptures, we've got just a few scriptures, a few, t- a few minutes left. L- listen to these passages of scripture. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness. The church is to follow holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. This brother that's practicing sin in the church of Corinth, he doesn't know God. If he did know God, he wouldn't be practicing sin as a way of life. Are there people in your church, in your church, maybe in the leadership that are practicing sin as a way of life? Are they shacking up with their girlfriends? Are they, are they going to the bars on Friday and Saturday night and they're supposed to be leaders in the church? Do you think they really know God? See, these issues need to be addressed. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15, 15. He says, God commands us to be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And then Peter says this, are you called of God? If you are, then you're called to be holy. And Peter says this, be holy in all manner of conversation, which means conduct. And isn't it interesting how the Bible calls our manner of conduct conversation? Why does the Bible do that? Well, it's because how we live our life individually and corporately, how we live our life speaks volumes as to who we really are. Now, are we of, are we of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we of the world? That's, that's really the decision and the question we need to answer. If we're of the church, then we better be holy. If we're of the world, then we don't know God. And I'm firmly convinced that if we'll do the things and do them the way the Word of God tells us to do them, everything in the end is going to turn out to be fine. Well, what if we lose a few people along the way? Doesn't matter. God will make up for it. If we're true to God, God will be true to us. And if we maintain holiness... The blessing of God will be upon us. The Holy Spirit will be upon us. Amen. And payday may not come every Friday, but I guarantee you if we'll maintain and be doers of the word and be holy and live holy lives, then payday eventually will come. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Lord, we thank you for the correcting power of your word. Now, Lord, we are determined to be doers of the word and not hearers only, whereby we deceive ourselves. So, Father, we ask your blessing upon each and every one within the sound of my voice, and we give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if you were to die today, that you would be prepared for heaven? If you're not sure, then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. I repent and ask you to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 
I surrender my heart and life to you. By faith, I believe I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for receiving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed this prayer and desire to know more about the gift of Christ that the Heavenly Father offers you, then email us at rbtc86 at gmail.com. We will be glad to answer your questions promptly and provide you at your request with materials that will help you to grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus. This is Patsy Dunning. Thank you for listening to our broadcast today. And let me remind you to tune in to this station at the same time next week to hear more of the wonderful words of life. God bless you and remember what Jesus said. It is the Spirit who gives life.